As humans, we are not the only living inhabitants of this planet, yet our actions can have significant impact on the survival of all species, including our own. If we plan to continue living on Earth, and there don't seem to be many other options right now, then we need to be responsible and do what it takes to sustain not only our own personal needs and wants, but also do what it takes to sustain the ecosystems that provide the raw materials for our livelihoods. Such as the ecosystems within our mountainsides, ocean fronts, and countrysides. How do we sustain them for future generations? We turn them into working landscapes. What is a working landscape? Well, it's a healthy, natural ecosystem that thrives under human influence. Within a working landscape, you might find a farm, a state park, a business, a forest, and a home. You might see cattle grazing, tourists hiking, miners mining, farmers farming, and people working. Ideally, all the inhabitants within the working landscape will balance their own needs with the needs of the environment. Striking that delicate balance is referred to as mutual sustainability. Everyone's needs are met in a way that will maintain the landscape far into the future. To achieve this sustainability, three elements need to work together. The social element, the ecological element, and the economic element. But not all places can be working landscapes. Some places we want to protect or preserve so the natural state is maintained for the foreseeable future. In these places, ecological concerns are a much higher priority than economic or social. Other places have been so drastically altered through human actions that they can no longer sustain their once native inhabitants or landforms. In these places, our economic and social needs have taken priority over ecological needs. To have a successful working landscape, the social, ecological, and economic elements need to work together. Each element needs the appropriate attention to stay healthy and in balance with the other two. Obviously, humans are the source of the social and economic elements, and our actions have an impact on the ecological elements. But what exactly is the human role in a working landscape? When I think of a working landscape, I think of a landscape where people uh, understand how they fit on that landscape and are living in a way that works with the landscape. They're earning a living um, in a way that, that doesn't detrimentally impact the landscape. It's working with how all of the processes work on the land and it's working in a fashion that it's sustainable. So why are sustainability and responsibility so important? Two reasons, time and space. Most of the natural landscapes that surround us have existed for hundreds or thousands of years, and we want them to remain there hundreds of years from now. Our time as humans is relatively short, but with careful planning, time will roll on for our working landscapes. Space is another good reason to pay attention to working landscapes. We know we're gonna grow. Our populations grow, our economies grow. We get more buildings, we get more shopping opportunities. Where are the best places in the community for that? If critical thought is not given to landscapes now, families, neighbors, and communities may not be able to maintain their landscapes for future generations. These landscapes will suffer under the pressing issues that face them. These threats may include poor farming practices, urban sprawl, fish kills, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, and coastal erosion. Of the many threats, three underlying issues are essential to the future of working landscapes. Economic development, ownership responsibilities, and public versus private land ownership. There are many questions surrounding these issues. Can land and business coexist? Can cities grow responsibly without the detrimental effects of urban sprawl? What rights do landowners have? These questions are not simple, but if working landscapes are going to remain healthy for future generations, the answers must consider the social, ecological, and economic elements before time and space slip away. The issues facing working landscapes are especially evident in the fragile Luss Hills of western Iowa. Luss is a German word meaning loose, and it's the name of the soil that creates these majestic hills. The Luss Hills span about 200 miles north to south along the Missouri River in Iowa. 
The depth and concentration of lust deposits found here are only rivaled in certain areas of China. This makes the lust hills unique and globally significant. Endangered plants and animals like the ten-petal blazing star and the ornate box turtle are found on these lands. Lush and rare prairie grasses and flowers are plentiful. But the lust soil is fragile, mainly due to its fine, gritty consistency. This soil is extremely sensitive to water. In fact, you may have thought that water first formed these hills, as it did many of the mountains and landforms in this country. But the Lus Hills are special. They were first formed by wind. Twelve to thirty thousand years ago, glaciers were moving and melting over parts of the Iowa landscape and the states to the north. Due to the changes in temperature, the front of the glaciers would melt in the summer and huge amounts of meltwater would flow down the Missouri River Valley. But in the wintertime, water flow was significantly reduced and lots of sandbars and silt material were left exposed on the floor of the valley. Winds from the west were very strong during these times. They would whip through the Missouri Valley, pick up the exposed silt material, and deposit it on the east side of the valley. This cycle repeated over thousands of winters until, about 12,000 years ago, the glaciers disappeared and the wind diminished. And in their wake, the Lus Hills emerged. Of course, the erosive power of water eventually played a role too. Creeks and rivers, fed by rainwater and snowmelt, carved most of the distinctive shapes of the Lus Hills that we see today. Small towns, big cities, farmers, business owners, parks and preserves combine to make the Lus Hills a huge working landscape. Even though humans have worked this land for hundreds of years, its unique qualities have only come into the limelight in the last 30 years. Awareness of the current threats has also been heightened. Threats like erosion, mining, urban sprawl, poor conservation practices, and bad land use decisions. How can this landscape remain working and healthy in the future? Let's look at all sides of the issues as we explore more. In a working landscape, economic development can mean anything that generates money, development, or jobs. It can mean creating a new business, building a new home, farming new land, using natural resources, or tourism. Economic development helps us sustain our way of life, whether we live in a landscape or merely benefit from it. We all want a better standard of living. Let's face it, we want a better standard of living for our kids. So we want there to be economic development. We want there to be better jobs. We want there to be more choices in jobs. But at the same time, we all want to live in an area that has clean water, has open spaces, and has places to go where we can see wildlife and just be by ourselves. So how do we incorporate economic development with those environmental issues? I think the key is in a working landscape, and that's sustainable development. Sustainable development within a working landscape needs to support the social, ecological, and economic needs of the community. But how do you decide if an economic activity is supportive of sustainable development? A family farm is a traditional economic component within many working landscapes. Farmers use the natural resources of the land to create a product to sell. But as economic pressures increase, it can become more difficult to balance the productivity of the land with proper conservation practices. Depending on how a farmer manages this balance, a farm could or could not be considered sustainable development. Although farming has been an old standby in working landscapes for centuries, there are many new ways people are finding to generate income from a landscape. This bed and breakfast business in the Lus Hills could be an example of economic development that can sustain all three elements of a working landscape. In this ideal situation, the owner meets social needs through the interaction between visitors and community members. Ecological needs are met by maintaining the natural surroundings and educating visitors on the unique ecosystems of the Lus Hills and economic needs are met by making money on the business. This business owner has a clear understanding of the unique surrounding landscape. Sometimes understanding is the first step in planning economic development. It's a matter of understanding, once again, what you have um, in, your, in your landscape area and what's important and how, are you, how do you want to preserve and protect that that area. And once you have an understanding how it functions, you'll understand what what's critical for its 
support and sustainability, much like our human body. We have a very clear understanding of how our heart functions and we know that eating a diet low in fat, exercising, will keep that heart strong. In the Lus Hills, most residents believe that the heart of the region is on the front face, or west side, of the hills. It's the most visible and the most fragile. The soil here is most vulnerable to erosion, and the rare prairie plants struggle to keep their footing. Understanding the fragile aspects of the front face can help sustain this landscape. But regardless of understanding, some sensitive areas of the Lus Hills are still disturbed. Mining, for fill dirt and gravel, is an economic development activity that takes place in these hills, and it's a controversial topic. I wish the county would do something, put an overlay on the hills, in which they said that, that some, some of this mining is restricted. Uh, it, as the, the, the way it is right now, it's a person's right to do it. I strongly disagree with it. I think it's a mistake to do it, uh, but, uh, you know, a person has the right to do it. It's not only in the Lus Hills, it's with virtually every natural com community across the United States. Um, you see marshes drained for housing developments, um, golf courses, things like that, you know, and we're slowly picking apart our, our resources. At some point in time, you know, there's not going to be anything left. It has to stop sometime. There has to be a compromise between what's too much and, and what's not enough. Sometimes that compromise simply means choosing more appropriate methods and locations. After all, mining does provide jobs, money, and natural resources that society uses for development. Just speaking in terms of the Lus Hills here, we have, we have a need for rock, for limestone, gravel, for roads, and for all of the things that we utilize that resource for in terms of development. And it's necessary that we have those things, so it's going to be necessary that we have mining. Um, but I think that we can be strategic about the way that we position those mines and the way that we go about doing that and, and always try to keep in mind that what makes this region unique is the Les Hills and there are ways that we can we can extract the resource that we need but we can make concessions to the land so that it can it can still operate as a functioning system. Some consider a resource of the Les Hills to be the scenic vistas and wide open spaces this resource has proven to be quite popular. Because of this, these spaces are quickly becoming dotted with residential housing, or economic development. Some people refer to this as urban sprawl. By definition, urban sprawl is the spreading of urban developments, as housing and shopping centers, on undeveloped land near a city. Basically, that means people start spreading out by building houses and businesses farther and farther from the city center. It's like we see in the Los Hills here. People love to build on top of the ridges. They get a gorgeous view when they build on top of ridges. They can, they can see the Lus Hills for miles. The problem is when the next person has the same idea and they come along and they put their house on the next ridge over, then the first person has lost their view that they went out for in the first place. It's called the tragedy of the commons. It's been, with, it's been recognized as a phenomenon forever and is happening here in the Lus Hills. But not everyone agrees that urban sprawl is a negative thing. It's a word that's getting a bad name. It, it, I would prefer that we would just say there's economic development going on. Uh, sprawl can happen, and that is basically done if people want to leap and bound by 10 acres with their homes or 20 acres. There's a lot better way to plan a subdivision instead of leaping and putting a home every 10 or 15 acres out there. We can cluster the homes and preserve the area and have open space. What do you think people should consider when building a home or business in a working landscape? How can urban sprawl actually be beneficial to a community? If somebody wants to move out to the country in the Lus Hills, I think they should um, learn more about them so they're not totally ruining them kind of protect them while they live out there. I think there should only be a certain amount of acres that could go towards housing. People yeah. can only have like so much of land if they want to buy something. I think people should be careful where they build in the Les Hills, kind of respect the land, maybe get a view but not necessarily on it. 
urban sprawl sometimes can be a good thing because it like expands cities and has more population in the state. It'll give the Iowa a bigger economy. In a working landscape, what landowners do with their land can have effects on the social, ecological, and economic aspects of the area around them. Do they have the right to do whatever they want with their land? Do they have the right to build on it? The right to farm on it? What about putting up a giant billboard? Considering the rare and fragile nature of the Lus Hills, ownership rights can take on a whole new meaning. We look at land as a bundle of rights. Let's take a bundle of sticks. Like one of the, the rights in that bundle is the right to build a house on it. Okay? One of the rights is to put a sidewalk on it. One of the rights perhaps is to build a business on it. One of the rights is not to pollute the water. One of the rights is not to build a smelting plant in a residential neighborhood. So the idea is there are some rights that we do have with private property, but there are some rights we don't. You can't do just anything you want. The key is, how do we decide what those rights are? How big is that bundle of sticks, and what type of sticks should be in it? If you live in a city, zoning can determine your land use rights and responsibilities. It can determine if land should be used for housing or for business. But some of the zoning laws in the Lus Hills aren't very restrictive, and some areas don't even have zoning. Consequently, what one neighbor does to the land might not be against the law, but it could influence the neighbor's property. The way a, a given landowner uh, might use his land does or can impact his neighbor's adjoining property. Uh, take, for example, um, a homeowner in, in a city, for example, in a city neighborhood. If he decides he's not going to pick up the trash in his yard or he's not going to mow the lawn, you know, that's going to have a negative impact on his neighbor by making the neighborhood in general uh, look um, run down, dirty, you know, trashy. Um, here out in the Lus Hills, when you think about that, if you've got um, an individual that is using his land in a way that isn't compatible with the natural resources, for example, he's uh, building a home or, or a structure on top of a ridge, and he's got a neighbor that owns land at the bottom of the hill, um, he might get some erosion that takes place and slumping of the hill. The land operates on a, on a philosophy much different than ours. And we talk about neighbors having this piece of property and this piece of property. And there is a property line, maybe even a fence line, between these two properties. But in, in terms of the land, there's not a care in the world about that property line because uh, land operates based on watersheds or based on, based on biological communities. And it, these processes that interact on the land don't care about political boundaries that say, I own this side, you own that side. And so these processes are working together regardless of those boundaries, and neighbors need to recognize that. And if they can understand how they fit into that system and, in a sense, forget about those political boundaries. So what do you think your neighbor's rights and responsibilities should be when it comes to their land use? What do you actually own when you buy land? I think what you own when you buy the land is you own everything except the animals, but you should respect the land and that it's not just yours, but it's everybody else's too. And don't let the soil erode or anything yeah. and build yeah. terraces and stuff to help that. Put trees up. If it's going to hurt somebody else, I don't think you should do it unless you ask them first. Yeah, don't do anything stupid to harm like your neighbor's water supply. Yeah, or like make one of those big hog confinement buildings and then have a bunch of runoff go into their water. If it's something that's going to smell, you're going to smell it on your land too. So I think you should ask your neighbor first. Working landscapes are social, ecological, and economic communities that exist all over the world. You might be surprised to know that most of our nation's precious landscapes are privately owned. Is that good or bad? Should our fragile river fronts, ocean fronts, and mountainsides be held in public ownership instead? There's appropriate management structures or, or 
or places for various ecosystems. Um, there's a number of private groups um, that do wonderful jobs at protecting fragile environments. There's a number of individual private landowners that do a wonderful job at protecting what's right there in their backyard. And it's a matter of um, we all collectively have to make the decision, is it in our public interest to bring that area into a public environment? There are many public environments in the Lus Hills. State parks, nature preserves, visitor centers, and hunting grounds. These areas are ecologically unique and worth visiting. But there are a lot of private areas that are also unique. Does that mean they are off limits to the public? Another example of how working lands have uh, a heritage is over in Europe, where in Austria, um, the, uh, many of the trails that sort of uh, wind through the Alps are actually on private lands. And people over there have a tradition and have laws that permit the private use, uh, the public use of those private lands. And there is a, um, a respect and a level of care that is required by those people that use that private land. Some residents of Iowa's Lus Hills are against any public or governmental intervention. Other residents think it's necessary for the future sustainability of the hills. We feel there is no problem, so why do we need the government here to solve one or create one? Uh, let's not have the government providing both the problem and the solution. When we have a problem, if we need government help, there's already government agencies in the area that are used every day. Uh, we really don't need more. We do have governmental intervention very close to us. Those of us that chose to work with their programs have that. And they seem to be working. Some would probably disagree, but there are those of us that are happy with it. It's a challenge. There isn't anything you're going to do that isn't going to be uh, something that takes your time, your attention, and hard work to do it. Tourism is a common component of most publicly owned working landscapes. While tourism certainly can be a key part of economic development, the fact that it often takes place on publicly owned land also makes it a public ownership issue. After all, tourists are usually at a national park, not in your backyard with binoculars. In the Lus Hills, there are many public preserves, parks, and scenic overlooks. Some of these areas suffer from overuse and irresponsible use. This also holds true for the country's national parks and preserves. If the landscape is popular and fragile, tourism can be an ecological liability. We as an agency, National Park Services, we're really looking at um, areas of that have become degraded because of overuse. And, and this isn't news. It's been in, in many journals and, and papers of um, how we're having to uh, manage on a, on a higher level or intensity of our visitors. Um, Grand Canyon is a good example. We're now looking at mass transportation and, and ways to efficiently move people from one part of the rim to the other that isn't harming the resource. Um, air quality being one of the, the resources that are being impacted. So it's, it's a matter of how you manage. You might need more intensive management in certain areas and others not. Tourism gets your name out. It recognizes you or the community or the resource for, for what it is significant that you have. Um, but we've also got to do a very, very strong education component with tourism. We have to educate those people who are coming as to why it's important that you come, why is it important that this landscape or this ecosystem be protected, how should you protect it, how should you interact with it. Um, you know, and how you should leave it, what, what should be your um, ultimate response to it after, after you've been there. So how do you balance the desire to sustain an environment with the desire to see it? What positive effects can tourism have? It's both good and bad because pollution and then 
but it also brings money to our state. We should like have some tourism for the money-wise for Iowa, but also if you're going to be touring, don't like trash it. We want to keep this place the way it was thousands of years ago. It's almost impossible to have like 50,000 people each summer to go through a park and not have it be like trashed and paths worn in because that would affect the wildlife. I think tourism is kind of a good thing for our economy. It's kind of a bad thing because it could, more people come in the cars cause pollution or they could litter. Make it so that people can come here and see it, but not that they ruin it while they're here. Ah, uh, working landscapes. They're socially active, economically valuable, and ecologically sustainable. But the issues on the horizon, economic development, ownership responsibilities, public versus private land ownership, and so many more will only get bigger as time passes. These are not issues to be ignored or buried in the backyard. Speaking of backyards, take a look at your own window. Are you aware of working landscapes near you? What are the issues surrounding ecosystems in your area? I think if people grow up understanding the place that they live in, they begin to take some pride in that. And when you take pride in that, then you start to care for it. And then you try to live in a way that, that meshes with, with that area and works in sync with the system. And I think we have a healthier lifestyle. The sustainability of a healthy working landscape requires successfully balancing the social, ecological, and economic elements. Sustaining all of these elements is the key. Without carefully considering this balance, time may run out for our landscapes and the critical social, ecological, and economic resources they provide. What can you do to make sure the working landscapes near you maintain this balance? Determining your role in the landscape will help reveal what your actions should be. Never did you think that you would be living in one of the significant treasures of, of the world, of the nation. Um, to me, it, it places so much responsibility upon you. And I'm not a large landowner, but it's, uh, it's important for you to, to make sure this landscape stays here, that it, it, it's here for, for my kids and my grandkids. Um, but it's equally important for my neighbors. You know, they don't know it. It's important that, that, that the landscape stay here. Explore more about working landscapes online at iptv.org. Explore more. This program was funded by the Roy J. Carver Charitable Trust, the U.S. Department of Education Star Schools Program, and Iowa Public Television.